Hi, everybody. I think we're going to get started. I'm so glad you've joined us tonight. Thanks for being here. I'd like to welcome Laura Moriarty and Kate Menconeri. Uh, Laura had a beautiful show at the museum earlier this season. Her encaustic work was just a joy to see. And when she mentioned to us that she had also had her work included in a show at the Thomas Cole National Historic Site, we were really intrigued. And so we invited Laura and Kate, who's the uh, curator and director of exhibitions and collections at the Thomas Cole National Historic Site to talk with us tonight about Laura's work and how it's related to Thomas Cole's work. Uh, and also to hear more about how the Thomas Cole National Historic Site is incorporating contemporary art into their exhibitions. Before I turn this over to Jason Vardacor, our curator of special projects, uh, I'd just like to thank the museum's major funders, the New Jersey State Council on the Arts, an, our partner of the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Geraldine R. Dodge Foundation. So I think you're gonna have a really enjoyable evening. Thanks for being here. And Jason, I'm turning it all over to you. Thanks so much, Marjorie. Um, uh, like Marjorie said, tonight's conversation is presented in conjunction um, with the beautiful recent exhibition, Laura Moriarty Resurfacing. Um, but tonight we'll consider the life and work of the major American romantic artist, Thomas Cole, whose biographical dates are 1801 to 1848 in relation to contemporary art um, and specifically to the works um, of Laura Moriarty. In 2018, the celebrated contemporary artist Kiki Smith and curator um, Kate Menconeri, who we're honored to have with us tonight, organized Spectrum, which was an exhibition of contemporary art installed in the original historic grounds house and studio of the canonical American romantic artist Thomas Cole. So that exhibition included Moriarty's artwork, which was called Tableau for Thomas Cole, which we're going to explore in detail tonight. It was a grouping of colorful rock and geode-like wax sculptures, um, which are typical of the artist's work. But they were arranged on what I believe was Cole's original table-sized palette covered in a sheet of plexiglass to protect its surface. So some framing questions for tonight, um, before I turn it over uh, to Kate uh, Mancaneri are, how might Moriarty's sculptures have acted as colorful meteorites from the present, traveling through time to haunt Cole's works from the past? How might the institutional work of the Thomas Cole National Historic Site, including its contemporary art programming, and live in the past to enrich us now. So just, I'm gonna open in parenthetical right before I turn it over to Kate, because we have really interesting programming um, it also in conjunction with Laura's exhibition that I'd like to plug for those in our audience who might be interested. Um, we have two intensive sessions, um, in which participants will be introduced to an ongoing collection of quote unquote specimens that Moriarty creates as they experiment um, with both the making of their own small geode-like forms and Moriarty's approach to encaustic monotype. Um, so Laura will be leading this um, uh, workshop which anyone can sign up for. So I encourage you to participate in this in, in very interesting and I'm sure very learningful and enriching um, workshop. So close parenthetical. Okay, I think I'm starting, right? Yes. Yeah, and your, your interest in this is so exciting. So um, this is a picture of the installation of my work in the room at the Thomas Cole House. And you can see off in the far uh, right corner, the largest painting. That's um, one of my favorites and one that I was really happy to have my work um, in a direct comparison with. And I'll, I'll show you a little of that in just a bit. You can go to the next one, Brian. 
um, here's a detail of the piece. Uh, I'm not sure whether this was a palette or whether it was a table that he used for his gem collection, one or the other. But yeah, it was such an honor for me and, and just such, such a geek out moment for me to be able to put my work on this table. Um, we can go to the next one. But also to see my work in direct relationship with some of these amazing paintings. And these are the original paintings. This is Thomas Cole's Prometheus Bound. It's um, a detail of the image from 1847. And we can go to the next image. And this is my pink Thufa from 2020, um, placed right alongside Prometheus. Very exciting very thrilling for me to even think of this work in this kind of context, because uh, one of the reasons I was so honored and excited to take part in the Spectrum exhibition was because um, Thomas Cole was always an artist who I related to because it always seemed really clear that for him, landscape painting meant something much more than just depicting scenery or, you know, presenting pleasant views. It was more allegorical and it often um, had these hidden subtexts about nature and also culture and sometimes science and spirituality. And, and I just thought that all of those different um, contexts were really, really exciting and interesting and made par art part of a, a larger cultural conversation. So we can go to the next one. Um, this is the Oxbow, which is, well, probably the most famous Thomas Cole painting. And um, the Oxbow is a shorthand title. I know that Kate's going to talk to you more about this painting, so she can give you more specific details. But one of the things that I liked about um, Thomas Cole's work was that it had this um, almost prophecy edge to it. So here we're looking at this beautiful landscape, beautiful scenery, but it's from the vantage point of a, a sort of blasted out tree stump, which kind of um, adds a little bit of foreboding to the, to the scenery. We can go to the next one. And I wanted to think about my, how my own work might um, presage you know, where we're going with, in terms of how we're behaving with the climate. This piece is called Swag or Scientific Wild Ass Guess. And it's, um, it's a version of a piece that I was showing a lot in 2008. This was at Spaces in Cleveland, Ohio. And we can go to the next image. This shows people interacting with the installation. Um, which to me was inspired by, you know, I was sitting in the dentist's office one day looking at National Geographic and I came across a photograph, just a little thumbnail photograph in the corner of the page that I thought for sure was a piece of my artwork. So, you know, I went by it really quickly and then I went back to it and I found that it wasn't my artwork. I, I probably would have heard about that before getting the dentist appointment, but, um, but it was a picture of a coral reef that has been had been thrust up out of the ocean during the 2004 tsunami in Indonesia. And um, and it was just this dead coral reef sitting on a beach. And um, <laughs> I'm sorry, this is <laughs> taking a dark turn. You can go to the next um, image. But it, again, going back to the oxbow and thinking about relationships, formal and also um, relationships that are more about ideas about the landscape. And we can go to the next one. Um, one of the other reasons that I, I take uh, a certain amount of pride even in the work of Thomas Cole is because I am myself a native of the Hudson Valley. And I have to, I have to admit that I just feel a personal sense of pride that this, this painter came over from England and decided to um, project a sort of romantic, European romantic sense of the landscape onto the area where I grew up. And um, we can go to the next one. This is, that's actually a painting or a detail of a painting called, um, Kindred Spirits, and it, it was done in tribute to Thomas Cole the year after he died. 
It was made by Asher B. Durand and it depicts Cole and the poet, um, William Cullen Bryant, looking out over one of these sort of beautiful, typical Hudson River Valley vistas. And this one happens to be near the Platte Clove Artist Residency. That might actually be the Platte Clove. But um, I did this residency where you stay in this, um, this little cottage in the forest right on the Platte Clove that was once lived in uh, by William Burroughs, the American writer and naturalist. And you stay in this rough cabin and you have access to these hikes for, that, that take you to these incredible Catskill Mountain, Hudson Valley um, vistas and views. But what you actually have to go through to get to these places is just crazy in some cases. They're really dangerous and um, you know, they have names like Hell's Kitchen or Devil's Kitchen and Hell's Hole. And you really don't want to be caught anywhere near, um, you know, a rainstorm on these on these um, paths because, you know, they would just be really dangerous. And then here are these guys in their top hats with their walking sticks and their nice little spats on their feet. And, you know, they've gone through probably the same sort of... Um, adventure to get to these places. So what I did was I hiked with my sculptures and this image on the bottom is um, one, of the, one of the photos that I took during this residency at Platte Clove. And we can go to the next one and we'll see a few more examples of this. Just the, the places where I had to climb out to, to place the sculpture. I mean, I'm a little bit afraid of heights. My fingertips would literally tremble and shake while I was, putting the sculptures on these like little overhangs and then figuring out where I would have to go to get a good shot of it. So we can go to the next one and the next and the next and the next. And I'm ending with another picture of um, a Thomas Cole painting. This one is the subsiding of the waters of the deluge. So dramatic. And the next is I did another one of these mashups because I just love butting my work up against his. <laughs> it's like a then and now. And I believe that's it. Thank you. And now I'm going to introduce Kate, Kate Mencaneri, who organized along with Kiki Smith the exhibition Spectrum that started this whole. Um, idea for this conversation tonight. And Kate's going to tell you both about the program that she runs at the Thomas Cole House and about this exhibition and more about Thomas Cole and the Contemporary Art Program. Take it away, Kate. Um, how many of you are familiar with Thomas Cole? Normally I would get some response back, but I imagine there's different, different um, responses. Um, I'm going to change. Can everyone see that slide? Excellent. Okay. So why does Thomas Cole's work matter now in our moment? It's an excellent question. And it's a question that we ask ourselves every day at the Thomas Cole site um, in Catskill, New York. And it's where we preserve and interpret the artist's 19th century home and studios. And rather than tell audiences why we think Cole is important, um, we like to engage the artist's own words and works. Um, we've gone through his writings, his journals, his letters, um, and he was a prolific writer. He wrote things like Essay on American Scenery and Lament of the Forest. And we looked at his artwork and we realized that for us in trying to think about why his work matters in the contemporary moment, um, one of the big issues that matters most to Cole continues to have urgent relevance today, and that's how can we balance the built and natural worlds? And Laura, you talked about this a bit in your presentation. We can switch slides, next slide. Um, and I'll give a little Thomas Cole 101, but, uh, and I think a number of you are very familiar with Cole's work, but Cole was an artist working in the United States in the 19th century. And he's been celebrated as one of the first painters to visually represent the American landscape as something unique and worth preserving. 
He's credited with launching a unique American landscape movement. It's now called the Hudson River School of Art. It was not ever a name that he gave to it and it was never actually literally a school. We get lots of phone calls like, where is the school? Um, but it was a movement and it inspired generations of artists to come from Cole's writing, we know that he advocated for living in harmony with nature and for thoughtful development. And he took up his pen and his paintbrush to speak out against the deforestation that was happening around him, clearing the way for railroads and expanding industries such as the tanneries that were quickly proliferating throughout the Catskill Mountains in the 1830s. Slide please. Um, Thomas Cole found the Catskill Mountains to be what he called the sublimest in the world. And he wrote, I've just returned from the mountain, dark forest, rugged rocks, towering mountains encompassed us. It was grand. It was sublime. I found no natural scenery which has affected me so powerfully as that which I have seen in the wilderness in America. But I think Cole was also really shocked and anxious about what he saw in America. In 1825, which was the same year that Cole first came to the Hudson Valley and made his trip up the Hudson River, um, the Erie Canal opened, making New York City the chief commercial center and connecting it via the Hudson River to the Western markets and the rest of the industrial world. Cole's, we can change the slide. Next slide. Cole's anxiety about the environmental and social consequences of industrialization definitely stemmed from his childhood. He grew up in Bolton, Lamar, England, and was born there in 1801. And he watched factories and smokestacks kind of consume the landscape. In his little town, um, the Manchester, Bolton, and Bury Canal ran through it, and it transported raw coal and iron to factories. So you can imagine what this was like. Economic migrants displaced by the upheavals of the Industrial Revolution, Thomas Cole and his family left England to the United States in 1818. So he was both just completely captivated, but also saw the writing on the wall. Next slide. Um, instead of finding a pristine landscape in Catskill, he saw escalating development and ongoing destruction of forests and waterways. By the 1830s in Catskill, there were over 40 tanneries, 50 iron foundries, 60 mills, and the railroad. So now actually what's so interesting is that the Catskill area and um, Catskill Park is very pristine and beautiful and a lot of the land has been preserved and protected. But when Cole first came here, that was not the case. So um, as you can imagine, the tanning industry, next slide. Um, the tanning industry is one of the most significant sources of deforestation. Um, one of his earliest works, which is this piece, Lake with Dead Trees, 1825 shows recently felled hemlock trees that were stripped as part of the process of tanning leather. And similar to the practice of fracking, the tanners would settle into an area, strip the hemlock bark, and then move on to the next area, destroying and depleting the trees and the forest as they went. Next slide. Um, this is a piece called Catskill Mountain House, The Four Elements. And in this piece, there's earth, air, water. And on the far right, um, there's also fire. And it's thought that this is fire from the tanneries, which sparked wildfires. And the hemlocks were nearly gone by 1845, which is the year after this painting was made. Next slide, please. Um, but if we back up 1835, Thomas Cole, the year before Emerson would publish Nature, Thomas Cole delivered his lecture on American scenery, which was later published Essay on American Scenery. And in this text, he writes about the kind of conventional elements of landscape, mountains, forest, sky, but he ends it talking about his distress. So I'll read you a passage from that. He writes, yet I cannot but express my sorrow that the beauty of such landscapes are quickly passing away. 
The ravages of the ax are daily increasing. The most noble scenes are made desolate and oftentimes with a wantonness and barbarism scarcely credible in a civilized nation. The wayside is becoming shadeless and another generation will behold spots now rife with beauty, desecrated by what is called improvement. So what is improvement, right? Change slides, please. So this is a picture of Catskill Creek, the landscape um, where Cole made his home. And this is one of his favorite spots. Um, the Catskill Creek is a tributary of the Hudson River. And he painted it over and over again over the course of 15 years that he was living in Catskill. And in this slide on the left, you can see um, this beautiful landscape where there's balance, there's a mother and a child. The landscape is still much greater than they are. It's exuberant and alive. There are a few tree trunks in the front that foreshadow the inevitable changes that are in fact already happening. When this painting was made, the railroads had already been, the railroad tracks had already been laid. Um, and on the right is the, actually the same exact scene of Catskill Creek, but now you see the landscape's been flattened and cleared of trees and there is a train in the distance. The mother and child are gone and there is a man with an ax surveying the surrounding lands. And Cole described this landscape in transition um, August 1st, 1836 in his journal he wrote, Last evening, I took a walk up the valley of the Catskill above Austin's Mill where the railroad is now making. This was once a favorite walk, but the charm of quietness and solitude is gone. It's still lovely. Man cannot remove its mountains. He's not yet felled all the woods. The stream will have its course. If men were not blind and insensible to the beauty of nature, the great works necessary for the purposes of commerce may be carried on without destroying it. And at times might even contribute to its charms by rendering it more accessible, but it's not so. They desecrate whatever they touch. So it's pretty powerful. Um, next slide. This is a work, one of his well-known works, The Curse of Empire that he created um, 1834 and 18, to 1836. Um, and it's a series of five works on canvas and it's a cycle where one sees a landscape that's been transformed by human intervention. And it moves from this kind of pristine natural world to the last work, which is called Desolation. Um, and it shows the rise and fall of a human civilization, kind of as if a cautionary tale, but what I, one of the things I love about this piece is in the very last one, Desolation, it's these ruins, um, but there are bird's nests and birds on top of some of those um, pillars. So maybe nature will regenerate, um, but I love this work because it speaks to Cole's fascinations with cycles and history and this power of nature to regenerate. So for me, if you were to say, why does Cole's work matter? I would say, I love the questions that I see in the work. Um, can we balance development with preservation? Can there be harmony between nature and culture? And I think Laura, you talked about this too in your work. Um, so for change slides, please. Um, chapter two, open house. When asking why does Cole's work matter now, we might also ask to whom. And as we know, um, many artists today draw inspiration from Cole's work or productively challenge Cole's work. So at the Cole site, we also consider the relevance of his work through the lens of today's artists and thinkers. And in 2016, we launched a series called Open House, Contemporary Art and Conversation with Cole. And in this series, we invite contemporary artists to respond to Cole's work or ideas or the history of the site and to create site-specific installations and exhibitions within his 19th century historic home on the grounds and landscapes and in his studios. And it's very collaborative. It's so much fun to work with artists 
um, and kind of operates from this concept that all art is contemporary. We see art in our present moment and the context of the time period of when it was made and by whom is really important and part of how we understand it, but we are always looking at art now in this moment. So there's so many layers to it. Um, the installations that we've done have ranged from, you know, kind of work that literally references Cole's work to works that expand upon themes and ideas that matter to Cole, such as landscape, environmental preservation, history, the sublime and color. So when we begin planning a project with an artist, I usually ask them, what do you wanna do here in this 19th century house that you can't do anywhere else, that you can't do maybe in a white box gallery? Um, because not only do we want artists to think about coal and the history in the United States, we also wanna offer them a chance to create something completely unique in this context um, and to honor the history of our site as a place for making and thinking. Next slide. And I'll move into chapter three, my final chapter, uh, case studies. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the projects, a few of the projects that we've done that I've loved. And um, one of my favorite open house projects was working with the artist Chi Guari on his exhibition, Absence Presence. For this exhibition, Guari spent 10 months retracing the footsteps of Thomas Cole, and he visited museums across the country to see Cole's paintings. He read all of his writings and um, went into the Catskill Mountains to the places that Cole had painted and created new giant camera obscura photographs of the landscapes that Cole had painted 180 years ago. Let me change the slide. There's Quarry. And then change the slide again. And he, to do this, he built giant cameras out of uh, box trucks and then he custom made these um, giant tents to form the compositions. And the resulting photographs offered a completely new way to see the landscape. Next slide. Um, we installed these new works in the historic rooms with Thomas Cole's work. And you really have to see them because the level of detail is extraordinary. But um, it was very exciting to me because it afforded a chance to explore landscape history and art um, in a cross-cultural exchange as well. This is the first time that an artist from China had presented artwork within this 19th century home by this famous American artist, this man who's credited as founding, you know, the most important American uh, landscape movement. So that was really exciting. And together the installation um, for me brought to light these connections between American landscape art histories and much, much older ancient landscape traditions that began in China in 11th century Song Dynasty. Next slide. So you can see Shiguari's work of Catterskill Falls alongside a sketch that Cole made of Catterskill Falls and then this gorgeous um, 11th century Song Dynasty work. And to see the distances and the perception, all of it together was really quite extraordinary. Um, Guari's work you know, he sees his work as being inspired both by American landscape traditions, but also by Chinese landscape traditions. And he told me, one of my favorite things he ever said was that um, the gap between his work and Thomas Cole, 180 years, is very, very short in comparison to this much longer history of art and landscape. And that he rather felt like he and Cole were contemporaries. And so next slide, and next slide. This is more views of the installation, next slide. On the occasion of the project, he turned Thomas Cole's sitting room into a camera obscura and made this work of um, Cole's desk and the view that Cole would have seen of the Catskill Mountains from his um, desk every day. Next slide. 
So although they're working in different centuries, both of the artists confront the impact of rapid development and loss. And I'll just read um, a quote by Quarry that I found relevant because it echoes Cole's lamentation of the changing landscapes that he saw along Catskill Creek. Quarry said, it's my belief that in today's world where global natural resources are being depleted, the game between humans and nature is nonstop. And it's a subject we cannot avoid talking about. While progress brings about development, it also changes the surrounding environments. In reality, how will humans survive if we do not face nature with awe or return to nature a reverence and respect? So I was really just so moved by this project and um, it, you know, from my own perspective, like I really saw and thought about the landscape from such a different way. And this, these layers of time and history were really um, poignant. So we carefully develop all of our projects working collaboratively with the artists. And it's often not until we actually put the artwork, you know, we plan it out and we make checklists and we, we think through it, but it's often not until we actually put the work um, inside Cole's 19th century home next to his furniture and his paintings that these unexpected connections and conversations happen. And this was also the case when we presented um, an open house project with the artist Kiki Smith. Next slide. Um, Kiki Smith is an amazing artist and really has an, a visionary approach to art and history. She's done installations inside palaces in Italy and in the period rooms of the Brooklyn Museum. And so we were completely thrilled when she decided to create a new multidisciplinary installation in Cole's home. And after a few conversations, we discovered that Smith and Cole, while residing about a mile and two centuries apart along the Catskill Creek in New York, both made work that was directly inspired by Catskill Creek, um, which is the, you know, the waterway that flows from the Catskill Mountain to the Hudson River. Next slide. For the installation, Smith filled the artist family home with, among other things, saplings, crystals, this kind of wild kingdom of animals. Change to the next slide. Um, wolves, um, next slide. Deer, turkeys, doves, next slide. Um, kind of just this whole um, wild kingdom of animals that you can see in the Catskill landscapes, but also inside a painting by Cole. Next slide. And so these are installation views of her work installed within the house. Next slide. Um, the installation included these nine foot tall woven jacquard tapestries. And this one is called Congregation. Um, and Kiki was telling me about this work during Hurricane Irene, about 150 trees just fell down on the land. And she said most of them were black locusts. The creek rose to about 28 feet and trees fell like pickup sticks. They were all entangled. And that was the beginning of congregation. What happens to one thing happens to all. So if Cole's landscapes are epic and sweeping, Kiki's works and interventions allowed us to focus on these iconic elements of what makes up a landscape or an ecosystem and the natural world and how all these elements are interconnected. And it felt like, next slide, with Kiki's installation, um, you know, I'm very aware that we are working in the home of an artist and a family that has been gone for over a hundred years. But um, after Kiki created this arrangement inside the house with artworks and objects, it was almost, it was, it was just so transformative. It felt like she was awakening something that had been dreaming and um, she activated this conversation between past and present and the Cole family became so much more real to me through looking at this contemporary art installation. It was really extraordinary. 
it was during the time that Kiki and I were working on her installation that um, we started talking about Spectrum. And I had asked her what her favorite painting by Thomas Poole was. And she said, well, I don't have a favorite painting, but the way that he used color and his evident interest in light phenomenon found in nature is what she was most attracted to. And she had been working a lot with color in these giant tapestries, um, which, you know, the tapestries are individual threads of color. So it's thousands and thousands of threads of different colors that come together to form an image. So we were just kind of talking a lot about that. And at the same time, artists would come and visit me at the pool site and they would see Thomas Bull's color wheel. Switch, change slides, please. This piece. And they'd be like, oh my God, I can't believe that was Thomas Cole's. It looks so contemporary. And they were kind of astonished. It's we call it Cole's color wheel, but it's a diagram of contrasts. Um, where he's thinking about light and dark and how it affects color and shade. And Cole was fascinated with color and it's evidenced in this diagram of contrast. It's evidenced in the colors that he chose um, for the walls of his home. You saw some of them in the, those periwinkle walls and he painted friezes directly on the walls of his home. Um, but he also wrote extensively about color and filled his journals with color diagrams and maps that connected colors to human emotions and musical notes. Next slide. So these are some of his handwritten notes. Next slide. In this, he's um, checking the colors that bark makes and using bark as um, pigment or color. Next slide. Um, and he even wrote this detailed description outlining a musical instrument that he wanted to invent that would play the sound of color. And for a long time, everyone was like, oh, he must have been synesthetic. But in fact, he was really just wrestling with this idea that color, you know, Isaac Newton's idea of color um, and Goethe's uh, theory about color, which were very different. Cole understood our ability to see color and color itself is seated in science, um, that it was both the material of earth in the form of pigments. And he actually ground his own pigments out of things like lapis lazuli and matter root and actual elements of the earth. Um, but he also understood that it was part of the visible spectrum of color that's light and he was equally captivated by color for its expressive power and its relationship to music and sound. So it's kind of all over the place. And um, we worked with this great artist and um, color theorist, Jesse Bransford, and he wrote a new text on the occasion of the exhibition that was kind of just talking about, well, these were these competing theories about what color was in the 19th century. and. Um, it wasn't that simple, it was expressive, but it was also science and I loved that. Um, so in 2018, we launched this new exhibition spectrum and it brought together Cole's works and writing about color with the work of 11 contemporary artists, including Laura's work. And I, next slide. There. Um, each artist featured in Spectrum was invited to collaborate in the presentation of either existing artworks or to debut a new installation created specifically for the exhibition and for the site. And the works that we chose were really diverse and they examined color um, as something at the intersection of art and science, um, as light and material, but also in relation to the senses, smell, sight, taste, as well as music and physics, abstraction, and both the synthetic and the natural worlds. Next slide. And I'll just show you quickly some of the um, works that were in here, but this was an immersive light sculpture by Anne Veronica Janssens. Next slide. Portia Munson designed a living um, flower garden that was based on this mandala photograph, um, thinking about the colors of the natural world and flowers. And Cole actually wrote in his journal about how 
different color flowers should be planted in different places of sunlight and shade um, to bring about the most poignant aspect of the colors. So it was really, we were really excited when Portia said she would make this garden um, based on her own work. Next slide. Anne Lindbergh um, responded to Cole's diagram of contrasts and created this new site specific thread installation that um, offer this incredible chance to see how colors interact in the shifting light and darkness. And next slide. Next slide. This is work by Mildred Thompson. Um, next slide. Radiation explorations. And in this work, she layered contrasting and complementary cues to explore the wonder of physics. And like Cole, she was fascinated between these relationships between music and color. So we installed her work in the children's room because it's just so, it was so much fun and it was so vibrant. Next slide, please. This is a work that Valerie Hammond made for the occasion called Blue Rainbows. And she was thinking a lot about um, rainbows and the color spectrum and how historically they've been thought to be the link between the physical world and the transient spectral realm or the heavenly realm. Next slide. Jackie Sokokio, um, we showed two of her works. They were gigantic, it was the largest paintings we've ever shown in Cole's 19th century house. And um, kind of monumental works, uh, it's scaled oil and mica. And they were directly inspired by the sublime. Um, and Jackie connected these to Cole's landscapes and the sublime feeling of the danger and awe of a storm coming in. This specifically one is about a storm, a tempest. Next slide. This is work by Julianne Swartz called uh, camera, she made these cameraless videos. Um, and she was interested in engaging optics that frame and highlight how we see the visible spectrum and how it moves. Next slide. Um, this is a work by Lisa Sanditz, and she created an entire installation in Cole and Mariah's bedroom. And you can see her painting, and then she um, also created a display with the hand-painted china by Cole's daughter, Emily Cole, who was also an artist. And um, next slide, please. The landscapes that Lisa makes are kind of layered these thick, thick layers of colors that she then scratches down so that they illuminate that what's below the surface of our landscape um, is something we could think about as the new sublime. Um, all of the history, the layers of history, but also the layers of pollution and toxins and chemicals. So here's this gorgeous starry night landscape and a car junkyard. Next slide. Linda Weintraub um, created this installation, Jars of Home Preserved Food, and she arranged them in the order of the color spectrum um, to think about the colors that come out of the earth, but also the colors that we eat and the colors that we taste. Next slide. Um, and then Laura Moriarty's Tableau for Thomas Cole, which, you know, for me, this is one of the pieces that was most exciting and profound um, and surprising. Like it was, it was very exciting to, you know, plan this out, but then when we brought it into this creative process gallery and it was here in dialogue with the color wheel and then all of these paintings by Cole of rocks and geology, next slide and his mineral collection. And you can't see that in this photograph, um, but this mineral collection was also very nearby. And it was just kind of amazing because, um, you know, these minerals are things that Cole collected over 200 years ago. It's minerals, fossils, there's some artifacts, um, but he, they're specimens and things he's collected from all over the world. Um, and to put that together with Laura's, um, works was just, it, it just felt really exuberant and Laura's work felt very radical, but also as old as the cosmos all at, all at the same time, like deeply connected to deep geological time, but also 
kind of radically contemporary. So next slide. Um, here's another installation view just to end with with this, and um, this was one of the one of the surprises. Um, you know, we're thinking about the mineral collection and the color wheel, and the surprise that Laura talked about earlier was the way that. Um, forgive me, I don't remember the title of this large pink piece, but the way that that, you know, suddenly to see that behind Cole's Prometheus Bound um, was just gave me shivers, um, but also opened up how I thought about not only Laura's work, but Thomas Cole's work. And so it was a, a really expansive and generative experience. And um, I feel like artistic exchanges within and beyond these confines of time that we usually think of chronological, when it, there is this exchange, um, these unexpected and remarkable things can happen. So it's very exciting. And um, I wanna thank everybody for um, listening. If you have any questions, let me know. And Laura, thank you again for um, letting us show and present your work um, in Spectrum. It was just such an amazing, project and I'm really grateful. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much, Laura and Kate. And um, those were such illuminating and rich presentations. There's uh, so much to talk about. We only have about 10 minutes, but um, we'll do what we can to field questions. If people have questions, comments, um, enter them in the chat and I'll um, try to get to all of them. Um, I just want to start by saying, um, you know, I think if Thomas Cole's work teaches us anything or teaches us many things, but one thing certainly is reverence for um, nature, of course. And um, if I'm recalling correctly in his essay, American Scenery, right, he's, he, com he, it's almost like he's comparing a tree to a human being, like, um, you know, a tree to a single individual. Um, so that kind of intimacy with, with nature, not as just a landscape or grand, grand or epic sweeping landscape, but the specificity of this is a tree and its bark feels like this and it taught me this. And um, this spec, like, so a reverence for, for nature that also comes out in somebody who would write a journal and say, you know, I think you should plant a blue flower in this kind of light and a red flower in this kind of light. It's, it's really moving. And it also reminds us um, how far we are from how disconnected we are in our contemporary moment. And yet also how close we are to those encounters, how easy it is in a way to just go out and touch the tree or the flower and to reconnect. And I think that, in a way, um, not to be too long-winded, but I want to just zero right in, Laura, to your work specifically and how it engages that, that we are so far from it, but actually we're so close. The tactility of your work as encaustic, right? As wax, it's so haptic, tactile. And it was just, it's mind blowing and just beautiful. And it's the subject of its own like seminar, essay something like about you going out on the cliffs and tucking your work in the rocks <laughs> like amazing so i guess my question for both of you or whatever we can just, just it can be fluid and i can shut up but like I, i'm just interested in 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 this this um what cole teaches us which is that nature is so close and um there are intimate and encounters with that the special specificity of nature and Laura maybe your how does your work speak to that I'm thinking about like the the thing tucked in the moss embankment yeah yeah, <clears throat> yeah. I think um I think we've talked about this in other conversations but I I'm really interested in matter and in the the sort of vital aspect of matter so I like to think that the, the rocks and the trees and the minerals and the plants all have an essential um, quality that, that makes them vital, 
that even though they're not they're not a person but in a way i think that they are you know they do have an essence and it's a different kind of essence but i really like to think of the world as as being like everything's alive everything's in play all the time it just keeps changing into something else but then that something else continues to change and evolve and becomes another you know big solid thing and then that solid thing breaks down and becomes little crumbs and and it just keeps happening that like this goes over and over again so <clears throat> you know we're and and we are part of that and there's a way of thinking about this that that sort of um it's really transcendent. It's like you you enter oblivion. You enter this sort of imaginative free fall where it's all just there. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I'm expre expressing this really well, but no, it's, you know, it's like a sense of enlightenment. I well, think. I think, well, Kate, you could speak to this way better than I could, I'm sure, but I feel like Cole would love, like Laura just said, Thomas Cole would be like, yes, that's vitalism. Like, that's my thing. Yeah, no, well, yeah, it's incredible. I and mean, we're all just made of the same kind of carbon of stardust, right? And like, we are all of these elements of earth. And, you know, it's interesting too, though, because, um, I mean, you know, I think Cole thought the earth was very spiritual and science was somewhat nascent at the time. Like the, the term ecology didn't even come out until 1863, the term ecology was coined and Cole died in 1848, but he knew that there, there was an interconnection and a balance and that if these um, hundred year old hardwood trees were chopped down that that was going to have major consequences on the whole environment and the whole landscape. Like he understood that somehow, those relationships, um, even though ecology and biodiversity weren't even terms, he, I think he understood that balance. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think Cole would love your work, Laura. Just, I mean, look at his mineral collection, right? And he's like, and what's interesting about like, he collected minerals and he also had um, a book of herbariums and, but he was less interested in like the specimen, like he, the labels for them are like from Shakespeare's garden, from the temple of Juno. Like it's not interested in like scientifically what it, what it is. He's more interested in it as this object of the earth and um, culture where culture and, and nature kind of, it's all one. But I, what I think, Anyway, what you were saying, Laura, is really profound and beautiful because we are all just the stardust, you know? I think it speaks to the power of art, which, you know, um, I think, you know, this is partly about Cole and it's partly about Laura. And it's also just about like how, how the power of art. I love what you said, Kate, and I've been thinking about this a lot recently too, that, um, all art is contemporary because we experience it in the moment that we are alive, right? So in a sense, it, what it means to us in, a, in the contemporary moment um, makes all objects before us a kind, a kind of contemporary art, not to minimize their historical residue, but I think it's a great point in the sense that art has this power to generate and to regenerate. And, um, it speaks partly to what you were speaking about Kate, when you referenced and spoke so beautifully and eloquently and powerfully about all of the um, exhibitions that are part of um, the, the series at Thomas Cole National Historic Site, but specifically I'm thinking of Kiki Smith when she brought all this work in and you felt, um, or you reported that, you know, you felt that there was a shift or something in the site itself. And um, wow, that's that's amazing that that an artist can come in and intervene and then generate, um, you know, shift the energy of an entire kind of grounds. Um, yeah. It's like meaning making, right? Like as a curator or as an artist or a writer, like we're always kind of making and thinking about meaning 
And when you like put different things together in different contexts, it means it opens up these new meanings. And so all of the discrete works that we install have a meaning. And then when you put them in this other context or in a conversation with other objects, these new meanings come out and it, it's really exciting. Yeah, it's like that, you know, I never would have, when I think about Cole's Prometheus Bound, which was in Laura's um, uh, slideshow um, and that, that kind of outcropping and how it relates to Pink Thuffa, uh, which is the kind of larger pink-ish block on the table that Laura made, um, there's, su there's such a productive, um, you know, we don't have time to kind of like the very rich um, conversation that that is generating. But I guess um, maybe Laura, just cause you're the artist, you know, um, maybe I could give you the last word and just ask you like what it was like to, to have your work. I mean, you spoke to this a little bit, but like to have the, those works um, which are made now or we're at, you know, you're a contemporary artist um, in front of these kind of um, canonical paintings and you said yeah. you know you love pairing you like, love pairing these works but like maybe you could speak to a little bit more about that yeah well there was the the um more intimate experience of actually installing my work in the room and it was you know pretty much just my work I think one other artist maybe had a painting on the wall yeah yeah but um you know, just getting to think about my work in the context of those paintings that were on the wall and those pieces of furniture that were in the room and, you know, what they were used for by the, by Thomas Cole. There was that, which was just really, really exciting. And that is the room that I wanted my work to be in. If I had been the curator, that's, you know, that's where I wanted my work to be. But then there was the, um, sort of the wider lens of the whole program and all of the other artists. There were 10 other artists presenting work and we were all excited and we were all like thinking about how our work would um, tell a new story in this context. And, and so the whole story, you know, it, it included works out on the grounds like Valerie Hammond's and Portia Munson's works, and Linda Weintraub's pieces that were sort of tucked up in the eaves of one of the outside of one of the buildings. And, um, and then all the work in the bedrooms and the sitting rooms and the rooms in the house itself. It just, um, all of that work was really excellent. And, and it, pulled the experience of considering, you know, the more historical works in, in all these really interesting directions. And you just become a facet of that when you're in the, in the whole, like the whole program. So that's what was really, you know, very exciting to me, just to, to be participating in this event that, that was very much live and happening right then and, you know, together. Well, this could be an infinitely long discussion. There's so <laughs> much here. Cole makes his own worlds and his in individual pictures, let alone the Thomas Cole National Historic Site, which, yeah, these are encyclopedic, massive topics. And um, Laura, um, we were so lucky to have your exhibition and um, it was a gift to us and to our region. And uh, so was um, Tableau for Thomas Cole and so was Spectrum, and um, thank you both. They, thank you, Kate, Van Canary, and uh, Laura Moriarty for your presence and your presentations tonight. Thanks, Jason. Thanks thank for you, inviting Jason. us to do this. <laughs>